Hello, everybody. I've not really used these kind of mics in a while, so I feel kind of uh, cool. <laughs> I don't think I'm as cool as Pastor Joe, though. So, uh, you know what? Before I go into speaking, because this is, this is my home church, so I'm just going to be myself. Is that okay? So this is going to be more like me sharing some of my journey as opposed to like doing like a grand, um, incredible, whatever you want to call it, preach. Uh, but I just want to first honor Joe and Stacey. Before you clap, I just want to say, you know, sometimes you kind of watch people from afar. Maybe you might watch some amazing ministry that you really admire. I don't know, name them. Maybe in America, Australia, whatever. Oh, it's so amazing. And I don't know about you, but when I kind of come in contact with people that just carry God in an amazing way, and I don't have any relationship with them, and I'm watching someone, I'm watching something of them online, and I'm being so blessed by that, I think to myself, I wonder if the people in the room really value those people like I am over here valuing them. And so sometimes you just uh, got to just step back and value what God has actually placed right in front of you, as opposed to just looking at what's in Australia or Bethel or a Hillsong or a Fer- uh, Stephen Furtick. Love all those guys. Bless God for what they're doing them. But we've got world-class leaders in this room right here, right now. <laughs> I don't know if you were here last Sunday, but I was sat there going, wow, this, this is just incredible teaching. This is just so powerful, so life-giving. So once again, let's honor God and thank God for the life of Joe and Stacey and their family. Come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am truly, truly thankful for you guys. And... And I just want to say, that's not something that, you know, preachers do. Let's just honor the leader. And all, no, no, you know, I'm actually mean, actually mean it. Jill and Stacy, uh, friends of myself and Rebecca. So before I get into the word uh, today, I also want to honor all single moms. <laughs> and I, wait, 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 wait. Single moms, and if they're single dads, because I'm more used to seeing single moms than single dads with kids. The reason is my wife is in Nigeria for two weeks. <laughs> And I've had the kids. And you know what? Actually, I was dreading it. I was actually dreading Oh, no, no, no. This is going to be. But it's actually not been as bad as I was thinking. It has been a really life-giving experience, even though it's been hard work. And I realized how much driving, because I drive a lot, going everywhere, how much energy that sucks out of me. Because I'm at home and I'm feeling a lot more rested than I have done. But I'm also appreciating the work of single moms that have to get the kids ready, come to church, you know, get to the shops, trying to manage the kids, trying to grab things from the shelf. Can, can all the single moms just stand up in this? That, are there single moms in this? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, (laughs) it is a lot of work, so, you know, you just get to appreciate things like that. Lastly, before I get into the word, as you heard, a leader ministry got pressed on, we've got an an amazing conference coming up at the end of this month called Shift, and the, 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 the heart behind it is to see us as believers shift more into the purposes of God, see the nation shift into God's purposes as well. But it all starts with us, doesn't it? And so there'll be lots of teaching, practical teachings on prayer, prophetic teaching from incredible leaders uh, on our team and other leaders from outside as well. And so I want to encourage you to check that out if you want to just connect with that. It's going to be at the Message Trust uh, the last weekend of this month. I think 26th or 27th, something like that. 27th and 20, whatever the date is. (laughs) The last weekend of November. Oh, actually, my birthday's on Thursday, just to throw it out there. <laughs> so if you feel led. <laughs> right, so we're going to be looking at Genesis 12 this morning. Let me just pray. Father, thank you for this spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, as we go into your word, we thank you, Father, that uh, your word is transforming, your, lo- your word is life-giving. Lord, as it just expand on things that you've been stirring in my heart, I ask that you'd breathe your life on it today to bring transformation, and not just uh, revelation, even though I know that's powerful, but Lord, I ask for transformation in our hearts that reflect in our attitudes, our perspective, our lives, Lord, today. So have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 12, because we don't have a lot of time, oh my goodness, wow, time, time's already gone. Because we don't have a lot of time and I have so much to go through, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I might have to pace myself. And if I don't get through it, 
I don't get through it. But um, the Lord has been just uh, stirring me about the life of Abraham over the last few months, maybe. Uh, and I'm starting to realize more and more the significance of the person of Abraham. You know, he's known as the father of faith. And so his life is a template, basically, in that if you're going to be a person of faith, you're going to be a person that's going to journey with God, you're going to see a mirror of yourself in Abraham's, in God's dealings with Abraham. The way God dealt with Abraham, if you study it, you begin to see that God is going to deal with you in a similar pattern manner, especially if you call yourself a person of faith. So Abraham was a person that, you know, he's in his family. He lived with his family. He was having a comfortable life, and God called him out of that. And we come to that in Genesis 12, where the Lord says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of the family. Isn't it interesting that that's past tense? The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of the family. So what we're reading now is almost like God is picking up on, in the narrative, we're picking up on what God had said to Abraham. Uh, so it's clear that God said it to Abraham. It wasn't in that instance Abraham acted on what God said. Because Abraham was of his family, was of his dad, and then uh, Abraham's brother called Haran died. And then, I'm not going to go into that whole stuff because that would take us time. But uh, Abraham's dad eventually set out on a journey, uh, and he got to a place, and he stayed there, and he died there. And so now we come to verse tw- uh, chapter 12, and it says, Uh, The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, get out of your family, get out of your father's house. This is three layers of get outs. I want you to understand that God would not bring you into what he's called you to step into if you don't step out of what he called you out of. You can't be in a relationship over here with friends that represents the old season while you're praying for the new of God. And you're wanting to step into the new of God, but you're still linking up with the old. See, there has to be a disconnection, which truly is consecration, if there will be elevation into your next dimension. So you have to follow God in His leading. Sometimes His leadings will not, in fact, oftentimes His his leadings will not make any sense to your natural mind because it didn't make sense to Abraham uh, but he had to follow and this is why he's the father of faith because he is trying to follow God that he has no template for he's just hearing a voice how would you have explained to his family that a voice is said to him to get out do you know get out of your family and get out of your father's house is basically him saying to his family I am no longer part of this family tree. Disconnect me. I'm starting a whole new line. I'm li- it's not just a case of he's just moving somewhere else, okay? It, there's, there's, a big, it, there's a big deal to this, these words from the Lord. Get out of your country. He's, he's moving to a whole new place he's never been before. And then this is what the Lord says, to a land I will show you. So Abraham is taking a journey out to a place that he has no idea about, the Lord will show him. So he's journeying from the known to the, to the where? To the unknown, okay? Now, when you read about um, Adam in the garden, it's interesting that it always says that God comes to visit Adam in the cool of the day. Have you noticed never said Adam visited God? Now, when you journey through Scripture, you get to Hebrews, it says, without faith, Abraham... It's impossible to please God. God is a reward. Uh, uh, he who comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So to seek God, you have to actually go on a journey. So, he who comes to God is not he who God comes to. Now, don't get me wrong. In salvation, yes, God came to us. But as you journey in faith, you realize God is calling you to adopt the pattern of Abraham's life, which is you journey in God. So your salvation experience is just the beginning of a journey. You don't get saved. Yes, I've given my life to Jesus, and you just camp there. That is just the beginning. And God is expecting us to explore him like astronauts explore space. That there are endless realms that we need to journey in. But for so many Christians, you settle 
Because maybe you've got a good job, you've got a good house, you've got a nice wife and a nice husband or whatever it is, and you can get easily satisfied. You know, you can get satisfied with life. You see, one of the things that the enemy will try to do in your life if you're really serious about God is he's going to try to get you to settle. So right now, you may be in church and you may be going through a hard time. You may be having uh, a difficult time in your marriage. You may be having a difficult time in your family. When that situation is resolved or not resolved, let's just go with the path of resolved. You're praying and the breakthrough comes, the business grows. It depends on how how postured your heart is in journeying into God. Sometimes that breakthrough can become your satisfaction. And so because that need has been met, your journey stops. And now you're no longer journeying into God. You settle. This is why people in the persecuted church seem to be the ones that are causing the church to advance the most because their faith is under a lot of pressure. And so there is no comfort where they are. Uh, Some years ago, I went to Nigeria. You know, my heritage is, my dad is Nigerian. I was born in Liberia. My mom is from Ghana. I live in, Sto- I live in Manchester. My wife's from Stockport. <laughs> so I went to Nigeria. I've lived in Southern Nigeria most of my, all my life, really. Uh, but I went to an organization called Open Doors to the northern part of Nigeria. And it was amazing. And I got to experience uh, a whole new kind of world that I'd never experienced. Even though I'm Nigerian, it was a whole new world to me because I got to meet people that had been raped by Boko Haram and had had kids for Boko Haram, women whose husband had been slashed, killed right in front of her. You know, this one whose husband was shot in front of her, this other person whose husband was beheaded in front of them. And you then get to hear them worship. When I experienced that, and mind you, I've lived in the south. The, the southern part of Nigeria is like the Christian side. And it's, it's very western, you know, in the ideology, dressing, fashion. It's just that kind of vibe. And so I realized that the texture of Christianity in the north was very different <laughs> to the texture of Christianity in the south. And I'm realizing that the discomfort of persecution had brought a purification to the church. Now, let's bring that into the Western context. I want to say to you, we are not persecuted at all. I know you get laughter because you believe traditional values of Scripture, and you believe in, you know, in marriage between a man and and you believe all these things, and the culture is laughing at it. Listen, that is not persecution, really. When we consider other dimensions of persecution going on in the world right now, especially against believers and Christians. Are you hearing me? Yes. And so yes. the nature of persecution and all these things I'm talking about, they're there to cause you not to ever settle because it, it drives you on a journey. So have you settled? Right now you may be seated and you may have your kids and your prayer life is all about God meeting your needs. Okay, let's break down over the last week. What has been the content of your prayer life? What have you been praying about the most? Don't get me wrong. It's not wrong for you to pray about your children. It's not wrong for you to pray about uh, 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 finances. It's not wrong for you to pray about... But the content of your prayer life examined over a period of time oftentimes points to where you're at spiritually. Because if the content of that prayer life is all about just material things, the here and the now... When those needs are met, it's likely you're going to settle because the driving force of your pursuit is the need. Oh, Lord, I want a husband. Lord, I want a husband. And so do you realize your prayer request can become an idol? Do you realize you could be so desiring something and pray for it so much? It can become an idol in your life. And it's, it's like a spiritual thing. It's not bad, but it's, it's, it's in an exalted position. And you've naturally realized. You know, your children can become in an exalted position above God in your life. You know, sometimes your spouse, it could be anything. And if the devil knows that, giving you a certain boyfriend or giving you a certain girlfriend or giving you a certain house or giving you a certain job, let's just use boyfriend, girlfriend. Come on now. <laughs> yes. If the devil knows that giving you a certain boyfriend will cause you to settle, he will sponsor that relationship quickly. If the devil knows that your business growing and your church or your ministry growing is going to cause you to settle, 
he will pay the bills and send the customers and cause that business to grow. As long as you don't become like Abraham that's journeying and you settle, you're not going to have any impact in eternity. You're going to just be another Christian who is just going to church but having no impact. You are called to journey. The amazing thing about God, Jesus, I am the way. That doesn't mean you get on that way and you get to a destination. You are always encountering God. You never get to a place where you arrive and you've had enough. The way leads you to continual dimensions of encounter. But you have to be on the way. But some people get on the way and they don't progress. They settle in a certain place. And for someone that's been in ministry like me, for many people, even a growing ministry can cause you to settle. Bills are being paid. Things are looking good. And I want to say to you, Jill and Stacey and Ram Church, there's a reason why God is having us move from place to place. And I hope I can get to that in this scripture in a few moments. <laughs> he doesn't want us to settle just yet. He wants us to have infused in our DNA the mindset of a pilgrim. That we are moving, always moving in God. Uh, Abraham was a pilgrim. And so the Lord says, I will show you. So when he moved from the known to the unknown, he had no idea where he was going to end up. He just knew God said, get out. So he was going to just start moving. Okay. And then later on, in verse, verse uh, 7, then uh, Genesis 12, 7, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So now he started to journey and he's trying to hear God, but he gets to a place and the Lord says, this is it. So the Lord gives him direction and points out the location. See, let me just back up a bit. Actually, the Lord says, uh, 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 get out of your family and all that stuff to a land I will show you. In essence, the Lord was saying to Abraham, the destiny I have for you is connected to a location. See, I live in Manchester right now and I've had offers to go to other places and, you know, oh yeah, why don't you move over here? See, it doesn't matter how lucrative things are. In fact, I have some incredible offers uh, to, you know, Join this and shut things down over here and go over there. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much they're going to pay me, how much money they're going to give me. I know that this territory is the place for me. So I am assigned here. So God's purposes for me are connected to this location. Let, let's take it a bit further. Do you know that is relevant for you as well? God's purposes for you is connected to a place. And that place could be also a community. I hope you're not just coming here because it's a cool place to be. And I hope uh, Pastor John Stacey is not going to hate me for this. Listen. In, in the early church, it says God added to them. And then it also said people were scared to join them. So because people were scared to join them, their growth was as a result of supernaturally add, the supernatural addings of God. So God was bringing people into the community, no marketing skills, communication skills, and good worship, and nice tea. It was God that was adding the people. Today, we can go down the road of, uh, oh yeah, that church just feels nice and it looks good and blah, blah. You need to find, is God calling you to that community? If he's calling you, then your destiny is connected to that community. That's why you can't just pick up your bag and leave because the pastor preached the message you were not happy with. That's why you cannot just pick up your bag and leave because someone came into church and they didn't greet you and now you're offended. Because you know your destiny is connected to that location. You can't just leave because it feels good to your flesh. Did God tell you to leave? Or did your flesh offended? Now he's trying to get you out. And you see, your flesh will lead you in ways that God's not leading you. Your flesh will get you out of God's purposes. Because you're offended, you want to leave the church? Well... You're just 
forfeiting God's purposes and God's destiny for your life. When God said to Abraham, I will show you, Abraham is following a voice. He can't see God. So at this point, he cannot, be, he cannot afford to be offended at God. Because if he's offended at God, he's going to be stuck in the wilderness. Because God is leading him, and so he has to keep that relationship tight so that he gets the next destination. When you just step out to church, step out of this church, move to that church, step out of this church, and you're just moving, it shows that there is no government over your life. It shows that you're just living your life however you want to. I know you've been a Christian for five, ten years. You've heard lots of amazing messages. You compare this pastor to that pastor. But your life is not truly uh, manifesting the reality of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God means his dominion and his government over your decisions and your will. It's about his will, not yours. So there are times he's going to want to do things you don't want to do. And that includes when you're offended. In fact, he offends your, 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 your flesh to reveal your heart. And you don't want to face the reality that you've got pride in there. You've got all this old stuff in there. You want to just deflect and point to everyone else apart from realizing you're the common denominator in all those situations. Now God's trying to deal with you. So you're not maturing. And you're not following the pattern. See, many Christians are coming to church, but they're not changing. Let me tell you this. It doesn't matter how amazing Pastor Joe preaches. You're not going to change because of that sermon. That's the seed of God's word being released. Until that seed goes deep and it's incubated in you through prayer, through fasting, through obedience to God. It's just going to remain as a nice message that felt good in the moment. And then five days down the line, two weeks down the line, you've totally forgotten about it. Many Christians are hearing so many messages, but they're not changing. If I let me back up, many messages are being preached today, but they're being preached from the flesh. They're not being preached from the spirit. Because oftentimes it's about tickling people's flesh and making them feel good. But when it's from the Spirit, it often will challenge where you are, pointing to where God is. And even if it's from the Spirit, you have to take hold of it until it becomes real to you through your own surrender to God. It's only going to become a nice message you've heard, and you are not going to change. And so you're going to come to church for five, ten years, and you're still going to sit in the same seat. You're still going to get upset at the same things, and there's going to be no maturity in your Christian walk, and you're going to remain the same. And many Christians are remaining the same. I don't want to remain the same. I'm not preaching this because I'm mad at you. Oh, by the way, disclaimer, I am not mad at you. <laughs> I am preaching this because I want to see change. See, I don't just want to be challenged. I want to be changed. And so it means I need to ask God, what is it in my, in my spiritual diet, the way I'm receiving from heaven that is... That, that's not proper. That's causing me not to experience acceleration in my development. And oftentimes because we are wanting to be entertained. We're wanting to be made to feel good. We're not wanting to put in the spiritual work. Are you hearing me? I know you came to church this morning. Probably you're hoping, you know, the pastor's going to make you laugh and make you feel good. And Pastor Joe can do that next week. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, Pastor Joe's messages are very convicting and powerful, by the way. That's what I'm saying. It's not just a nice message. It's not just a conviction. It has to go deep, and you need to take that into the prayer closet. And then God starts to do something in you. If that doesn't happen, we are going to remain like this in terms of, when I say like, I don't mean, we might change location. We might change building. In fact, we might even grow in size. But we will remain like this in terms of our capital, spiritual weight in the spirit as a church. We will not progress. And I am not just after a crowd. I want to step into a room and know that we have, in, we have hit quorum. I don't know if you know what quorum is. When you have trustee meetings and you have this, you have to have certain numbers of people in the meeting for the meeting to be legal. We have hit quorum to a point where we can make decisions and pray in a way that will shift the spiritual balance over the region. 
many churches have not hit spiritual quorum because of the immaturity in the people in the pews. And sometimes on the platform too. In fact, many times on the platform. And I include myself in that. Because the fact that we're preaching, I hope you realize I am still a work in progress. <laughs> if you don't believe me, you should have seen me yesterday when I was shouting at justice for being naughty. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, they, there's a process. We have to, you cannot afford to settle in God. And so Abraham went on this journey. Okay, Abraham went on this journey. Seven, uh, what's it? Uh, 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 Genesis 12, 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham because he was following the voice of God. So when you follow the voice of God, you should expect encounters with God. Because in following the voice, God prepares encounters for you on that pathway. If you're following him, expect encounters. Because this encounter did not come as a result of Abraham's prayer life. Are you hearing me? Listen to what it says. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, it is Abraham was praying. Now, let me just read a few more verses before I carry on. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord. So, Abraham built an altar to the Lord that just appeared to him. Now, through Abraham's life, he built about four altars. Okay, are you with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He built about how many altars? Four. So this is altar number one. This altar came as a result of him following the voice of God. And in that pathway, in that pilgrimage, following the voice of God, he had an encounter that was something of a sovereign encounter. He did not instigate it. God, God came to him. Has God ever come to you before? You better know those moments when God comes to you because you can't afford to ignore them. I've had times where it's not been because I fasted, because I prayed, but I've had an encounter that I know that God has met me here. Remember I said that, you know, Adam didn't journey into God. In Hebrews, there's the whole idea of he who comes to God must believe. So we're called to journey into God in the New Testament. Even though he's journeyed to meet us through salvation, we're called to journey into him and encounter for transformation and to be the express image of who he is in the earth. That doesn't happen just because I said, yes, God has salvation. That is the process of sanctification. Am I saying too many big words here? <laughs> okay, so, so, so the salvation is a starting point. So we have to journey into God. And in that process of journeying, God actually sets up certain encounters for you in that pathway. That encounter could be at a conference. That encounter could be at a meeting. That encounter could be on your own. And somehow you've just met with God in a special way. And God starts to download things about your destiny, about your calling. And you're just aware God is speaking to you. You're having a special... Anyone had those kind of moments with God? And He doesn't give you the full picture you just get a sense of confirmation that you're in the right place. John Stacey would have that. You know, that you know that God sent you to England. You know that God sent you to this place. You are in the right place. You see what Abraham did after this encounter? Abraham did not write a journal and write a book and go on Instagram, take a screenshot of what the Lord said to him, put it on his stories for his friends to like, or write, you know, go to Elijah List and write an article and say, this is what the Lord said to me. This is the land. This is the land. Or then set up a conference, the conference called This is the Land. You know, <laughs> Abraham didn't do that. What he did after the Lord spoke to him is what we should do when we receive encounters with God. He built an altar. So the whole concept of building altars is something that's foreign to a lot of our Western minds, but it is a concept that's all through Scripture. It's all through the Old and the New Testament. It's one of the most significant things you can give yourself to as a believer. In the Old Testament, as we read it right now, it's a type and, a, and a, it's a shadow. It's a picture of something greater, okay? So Abraham actually had to put stones and put stuff together to build this altar. That's not saying that's what you have to do. That's a picture of what God's calling you to do in the New Testament. An altar is a place of encounter with God. An altar is a place where humanity meets divinity. An altar is a place 
where the spirit, where the spirit realm gains legal access to manifest in the physical realm. So an altar is both positive on the Jehovah God side and also real on the demonic side. Because altars are set up as a place for spiritual transactions to take place. So when we talk about altars, it's in this context, it's a space that Abraham built to capture the encounter he had just had with God. Okay, let me just put that into the context today. You have a supernatural encounter with God. He lights a flame on your heart. The flame he lights on your heart is supernatural. However, that supernatural flame needs to be maintained naturally. The supernatural flame has to be maintained naturally. So you maintain that flame like the priests in Leviticus where it says of them that the, uh, the fire on the altar should not be put out, but it must burn, it must burn day and night. Yeah. So really, to steward the move of God in your life, you need to build an altar, and that altar is a place of prayer. It's a place of worship, Pastor Joe's sermon last week. It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of priesthood because priests service altars. So Abraham built this altar to the Lord who appeared to him. This altar number one. The next altar we read about that Abraham built, let's go to verse 8. He moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So this is altar number two. Altar number one, sovereign move of God. Are you with me, church? Altar number two, he moved from where he was, altar number one, and pitched his tent east of Bethel, and there he built this altar to the Lord. Now look at what it says about this altar. He built an altar to the Lord, one, and called on the name of the Lord. So the first altar was because God appeared to him. Are you with me? The second altar was not because God appeared to him this time. It was because what? He was calling on the name of the Lord. What is that? That's prayer. So the texture of the first altar was a sovereign encounter that sparked that monument. This second one, he instigated it out of his own desire for God. He built this space. And see, when I said about Abraham being a pattern, God said to him, this is the land I will give you. So he was marking spots on that land with his altars, like, ma- like marking the boundaries of that territory in the spirit. Because before that land will be given to him physically, he had to gain that territory spiritually. Because if you read the previous verses, the Canaanites were in the land. They had colonized that whole territory. And so they had the spiritual influence over that place. And for the promise of God to Abraham to come to pass, Abraham had to build altars all over that land because he first had to gain spiritual authority before he could then, before his descendants could then physically gain possession of the land. Okay, so as I'm thinking about this this morning coming to church, I realize this is what I'm sensing about Ram Church. Could it be that God is not giving us a physical building yet? And the places we have been meeting so far are schools. Because the prophetic word was about an army of the young. We met in the first school for I don't know how long. And could it be that, remember when we had the first meeting then it was so hard. Could it be that our assignment there was to raise an altar there? Because we're called to lay hold of that promise in the spirit first. And now here we find ourselves, guess where? At another school. 
And we're having these prayer sessions from 9.30 to 10.30 on Sundays. And, you know, don't think that's just some empty thing we're doing. Is anyone hearing me? Here? Right. Like Abraham, we are raising up altars. See, 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 Abraham lived in tents. He, this is, this is what it says. He pitched tents and built altars. The altars were permanent. The tent was temporary because he was a pilgrim. And the promise was not just about him. Yes, he is the father of faith, but there was a lineage that God was setting where God, what God was saying to Abraham was going to implicate future generations. Your children, my children, it's more than just us. So sometimes God can give you a promise and you want to see here and now, but God is looking from eternity while you're in time and he can see the full picture, and you want everything happening right now, and God can see that you're not ready to handle the fullness of that, and that is not. Abraham could not possess the land himself physically in that moment. Now, I'm not trying to say God's not going to give us an army of the young. I'm believing for that in my lifetime. I'm believing for explosions of what God has said. But what I'm trying to get is there is a timeline that is not always instantaneous. Because before the promise can become manifest physically, there has to be some spiritual transactions taking place. And so the pilgrimage has to happen. You're leading a business. You want God to increase your business. You know God's calling you to business. Don't just think you're going to set up a business and that's going to be it. You better get the spiritual map first. And understand how God is wanting to give yourself in the spirit. Oh, yeah, you're, you're in the music industry. God's called you not necessarily to be a worship leader on the platform as such, but you're called to impact the secular world. You better make sure you have some strong altars before you go into that world. Because if, if your altar does not regulate you, their altars will regulate you. And believe me, they've got altars. And we're going to see that in a few moments. Oh my goodness, we don't have time. Let's rush through this. So Abraham has Isaac, his son. Isaac has what? Jacob. Jacob is, this Genesis 28, we don't have time to read it, but we can read it later. Genesis 28, um, um, Jacob is on the run away from his brother who is trying to kill him. You know why his brother is trying to kill him? He stole the blessing. Everyone say he stole the blessing. (laughs) So now his brother is trying to kill him. And like, what do you mean, brother, trying to kill him? Just because he stole the blessing. Like, I mean, it's not just his father said, bless you. It's, I'm sure his father could just say the same thing to Esau, bless you. Obviously, we don't have the same understanding of blessing because, J- what's it? Yeah, Jacob almost felt like, well, not almost, he felt like after he released the blessing to his son, uh, um, Sorry, Abraham. Isaac felt like after he released the blessing to his son Jacob, he could not then re- he, co- he couldn't release the same blessing to Esau. So Jacob, through deception, stole that blessing. Now I appreciate some of you are new Christians and you might not understand all of these kind of depths of stories. So I'm not going to try to explain it all, but I'll summarize it and just try to bring you the key message. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes. Jacob stole the blessing of his brother, and the blessing came from his father, Isaac. Isaac is the son of Abraham. God gave this promise about the territory to Abraham. Jacob, in stealing the blessing, did not know by receiving that blessing he was implicated. It wasn't just the case of, yeah, Jacob, now your life is going to be awesome. No. (laughs) The blessing you've received, Jacob, has a texture And now that blessing is going to regulate you because there are altars on the land that are servicing that blessing. So let me explain this way. Jacob received the blessing and he's on the run. He thinks he's running away from his brother Esau, but he has no idea that his grandfather's altar is summoning him. So this is what happens. He runs from his brother And he gets to a place. He thinks he chose the place. But actually, the place chose him. Because it says he picked a stone. And then 
that was probably one of the stones that his grandfather, are you hearing me? That was probably one of the stones that his grandfather used to build an altar. He has no idea. He thinks he's running away from his brother. The altar is summoning him. The place has chosen him. And he puts his head on the stone. And then he puts his head on the stone and he goes into an encounter. And in the encounter, God shows him what is really going on in the place he's in. In the encounter, he sees the heavens opened. And he sees angels ascending and descending. The angels are listening, they're ascending, and they're descending. And he says he sees something like a ladder up to heaven. Jacob has this incredible encounter. And the Lord then promises him stuff about, again, that place. So this is how you know that this experience that Jacob had was not some figurative, you know, like Joseph had a dream and it was the seven cows and the seven fat cows and the lean cows. And on, that was like figurative. This was literal because God, in, the, in this experience that Jacob had, God said, this place. So Jacob was viewing the spiritual reality of the physical location he was in. Have you tried to view this school from the spirit realm? Oh, wait. Have you tried to view your family from the spirit realm? Have you viewed your, your, your location, where you are? Because how things look in the natural is quite different to how it looks in the spirit. Jacob was being given an experience by God of what things look like in the spirit realm. And when he saw it, he said, he woke up and he said, this is a dreadful place. And this is what he says. I'm summarizing because of time. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Are you with me, church? We don't have much time, so I need to be with me as a roundup. Can I have the band up, please? He says, this is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Let me just backtrack a bit. When Jacob had the encounter... He saw the angels. Everyone say, he saw the angels. They were going up. Everyone say, going up. And two, they were coming down. You know what the angels weren't doing? The angels weren't coming down, one, and going up, two. They were, what? And coming down. You know why? Because what triggered that spiritual traffic was nothing in heaven. It was on the earth because they were going up. They were being sent up and then they were coming down. So what was triggering that spiritual activity was something that happened on the earth. And obviously, we read that earlier, it was the altar Abraham set up. Because God was wanting to colonize, God was wanting to spiritually colonize that whole region. So how does this connect with us? Are you with me? Because of time, I don't have, I'm not able to really explain some things here, but this is really where I'm going. And I, I wanted to really capture this. Jesus says in Matthew 16, in fact, let, before I go to what Jesus said, um, Jacob, in that encounter, he said, this is the house of God. What do we tend to call church? Right? But he said, Jacob said, this is the house of God, the gate of heaven. So a church is not qualified to be called the house of God unless there's a gate there to heaven. And... There has to be some kind of interaction between heaven and earth there. And that church will not have a gate to heaven if that church is not servicing an altar. Like Abraham, the texture of altar number two that Abraham set up was, he says, Abraham called on the name of the Lord his God. What is that? Prayer. And then look at what, what the Lord says in Isaiah 56, 7. My house will be called what? A house of prayer. And you know, Jesus repeats that in the New Testament. So now you come to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Jesus says, I will build my church, my ecclesia. 
And you know what he says next? The gates of hell will not prevail. What did Jacob say? This is none other than the house of God, the gates of heaven. So Jesus is saying, hell has gates. If hell has gates, guess what? Hell has altars. Are you hearing me? So God is wanting to raise up a house that is stood in an altar that's responsible for angelic traffic that colonizes the region that causes the church to have great impact. So we are called to steal that altar in worship and prayer. But also hell has a gate or gates. And then hell has altars. And hell has people that service those altars with their lifestyles. Some of them know what they're doing. Some of them don't know what they're doing. But either ways, just like there's angelic traffic, there's also demonic traffic. So we come into a territory like this, and we want to see the church grow. We want to see the society changed. How are we going to influence the spiritual uh, uh, b- balance? How are we going to cause the equilibrium so to shift in our advantage? Listen, I finish now. How are we, co- we going to cause the territory to have a different spiritual texture if the people servicing the altars of darkness are more submitted to Satan than we are to God? Are you alive, church? I'm looking at some of you. I can see you're not with me. Are you with me? We will not see the territory shift and ask the people of God gain possession of what God's promised us in terms of the nations, the youth, if we don't shift our mindset to realize we are pilgrims, we are servicing these altars, and we are opening up the gateway. It's like we're opening up the shaft, this prayer shaft in the Spirit to cause the traffic to take place that's necessary for the kingdom of God to truly advance in the region. And this is why this is important. Joe made reference to this last week. This is not just an altar we're building here. You know the crazy thing? You are a mobile altar. What does it say? Your body is... Yeah. So, it actually starts right here. You being one that calls on the name of the Lord your God. And when you go back home... You better make sure that your altar has got sacrifice. Your altar is active. Because if your altar is inactive, you are now at the mercy of the person or the spiritual atmosphere of that region. You are not the one influencing that region. The spiritual temperature is influencing you. You, what's it, uh, thermostat and thermometer. You're a thermometer conforming to the temperature. You're not a thermostat changing the temperature. Altars change the temperature. What does this mean practically? You go home and you dust off your Bible if it's somewhere and you find the space that you've maybe neglected and you say, Lord, I am going to return to this place of servicing this altar of worship and prayer. And maybe you might want to start by saying, Lord, I'm back. I've lost my focus. I've got distracted. But Lord, I want to service this altar. I want to open up the the traffic of angels ascending and descending so that your kingdom can advance. Holy Spirit, I want you to have your way here in me. And I believe that's going to have a knock-on effect as a body when we come together like this because it's connected to our calling for this region to build these altars in these schools because God wants to give us an army of the young. You understand with me? Let's pray and I'm finished.